Hello everyone, welcome back to another class on our course on quantum theory of many body systems in condensed matter. My name is Luis Gregor Diaz, I'm a professor here at the Institute of Physics at the University of Sao Paulo. And in today's class, we're going to discuss the Matsubara formalism and define these imaginary time Green's functions. So we're going to start with uh, discussing the imaginary time evolution of operators operators and why we have we need that in order to to treat the finite temperature case then we're going to define these imaginary imaginary time ordered Green's functions and see how we can uh, do perturbation theory with them similar to what we did in the case of regular time order Green's functions and the difference here is that when you write say Feynman diagrams uh, there will be a instead of an integral in frequency there will be a sum over discrete values of frequencies which are called the Matsubara frequencies so we're going to learn how to do those and then we can do perturbation theory with Feynman diagrams uh, using these Matsubara Green's functions and uh, with that we can uh, calculate expected values and and so on and so forth at finite temperatures. So let's get into it. Okay, so let's start by defining what we mean by imaginary time evolution. So for correlation functions calculated at finite temperatures we have this expression where this is a time average of these uh, two operators written in say the Heisenberg picture like with time evolution governed by some operator sort of some Hamiltonian age and since we are talking about thermal averages that will involve a trace of these operators multiplied by the density operator which is e to the minus beta h okay so that trace of course would be a sum over uh, say eigenstates of the this many body Hamiltonian age and there would, there would be then ex, an ex, sum of expected values over the the spectrum for, of these sequences of operators now notice that the difference between uh, what I have here in the density operator and what I have here in the time evolution operator is that the exponents here is imaginary and while the exponent here is real so the idea of an imaginary time would be to take these two uh, operators together and then consider this beta a sort of time in, in that sense would be like this would be treated as a evolution in time so uh, my time evolution essentially would be uh, more more linked or formally linked with the thermal averaging that we want to do here so how, how does that work so let's define an imaginary time a real uh, t that is imaginary so it's I'm going to define as minus i times a real uh, number which is this tau so that this product would be e to the minus beta h e to the i h t so i t is tau which is real so this would be like a time evolution in this tau where beta now is is a time quote unquote okay beta is like this inverse temperature defines now a time scale in this imaginary time evolution all right so in my Heisenberg picture I can write say instead of e to the i h t now t is imaginary so this is going to be e h tau and this is a real a real exponent exponential right so in a sense that would be my Heisenberg picture for my imaginary time evolution and notice that this is a kind of prop, a time propagator from say beta to tau okay so this is, is going to be important 
Another point is you can also define this imaginary type of evolution in the interaction picture. So here I would take that time evolution operator that we find in, in the interaction picture, try to remember to put a link to that class, it was early on in the course. And instead of e to the i h naught t, now t is imaginary, is imaginary, right? Then I would have these real exponentials e to the h naught tau, e to the minus h tau minus t naught, e to the minus h naught t naught. This is a Hamiltonian where I have, say, h equals h naught plus, plus an interacting part. And we'll come back to both, uh, we come back to that. But the point here is that of course, in the interaction picture, these uh, operators will evolve according to H naught. But again, here is just an exponential with a real uh, exponent here. Okay. So the difference between these two is that here I have H naught and here I have H. Now, it, it is easy to show that you can relate these two by multiplying this one by uh, these time evolution operator evolving from tau to zero and another one here from zero to tau. Yeah, you can, you can, can see here that uh, if I multiply this by say a tau here, there'll be a tau here, then I'll get uh, just this one would, would cancel with this one. And because of the zero here, there would be zero, this is, would be e to the h tau, and this would be one, I would, I would get precisely that. So we can, if, if you can write, see the, the same argument on the other side, you, you'd see why you would get this when I multiply this by this tau zero here. Another important point is that now beta is a kind of time, Right, so it's a time scale in this in this uh, formalism. So this would be what I can time evolve from zero to beta, right? It's like I just put zero here, and I get and beta here. So this would be e to the h naught beta e to the minus h beta. So if I multiply this by e to the minus h naught beta here, I would get e to the minus beta h, which is the density operator. So this is really crucial. It's, that's why why we're doing this, right? We can write the density operator as the non-interacting density operator times a, a, a time evolution from zero to this time scale uh, set by the temperature. So this is is really really important and and will allow us to to calculate these thermal averages in a very simple way so in the same way that we define the time ordered greens functions in real time we can define some time ordered greens functions in imaginary time and these are usually called the matsubara greens functions so they are in a sense correlation functions uh, in imaginary time, okay. So this is the the form in in position basis, right? Where these are the field operators, either fermionic or bosonic, uh, that create a particle with say a label could be spin sigma prime at imaginary time tau prime position r prime, and destroys a particle with index sigma could is could be spent, for instance, at position r, imaginary time tau. And here is the imaginary time ordering, which works pretty much like the regular real-time uh, order, right? So I get this order if tau is larger than tau prime, and I get the inverse order times this uh, sign change, whether they're bosons or fermions, if tau prime is larger than tau. And here's the more, um, uh, well, and in, in both cases, if, of course, if the Hamiltonian doesn't have uh, any uh, dissipation terms, so it is a constant, then both 
these functions would be a function of only the time difference tau minus tau prime just like in the real time case and here is a more generic uh, version where I, I instead of the field operators I, I have you no know, creation and destruction operators in another basis so I create a state a particle at state k prime at tau prime and destroys it at uh, time tau and state k and I have this in a time ordered fashion. Notice that uh, different than than the real time uh, real time real time time ordered Green's functions, where I had a minus i here. Here I only had this minus sign. Okay, so this this would be also another difference. Now we can calculate the free propagator. In a very similar way that we did for the time order Green's functions, if we consider a quadratic Hamiltonian, I'm calling it H naught, and this would be uh, sum over k over some number operator. It could be either bosons or fermions, and uh, we're going to show that I can calculate the the Matsubara Green's functions for this Hamiltonian, and it comes out in an analytical form. And will depend on the temperature through this Bose Einstein or Fermi Dirac distributions of these energies epsilon k as a, uh, and a temperature 1 over beta. Okay, so uh, we're going to do this calculation and also calculate its Fourier transform, and which will give me uh, the free pro propagator in uh, imaginary in Matsubara frequency uh, space. And these frequencies, they are not a continuous value. Actually, they are discrete value. And they, they will be, uh, for bosons, an even multiple of pi over beta, while for fermions, there will be an odd multiple of pi over, over beta. So let's do these, these calculations and see what, why do we, we get this, and it will be very instructive. Okay, so let's do the calculation for the free prop propagator here. So we're calculating this quantity with this Hamiltonian. And so if we expand this quantity, we would have something like this. For Let's consider the case where tau is larger than tau prime. Then the order is as this, right? We're going to consider the, the opposite order as well uh, later. But this would be this minus sign. Uh, this thermal average and this are the operators in the Heisenberg picture with imag imaginary time evolution where evolution is given by H naught. Okay, so I have here e to the minus H naught, tau minus tau prime, a dagger, let's put this dagger a little better here. Uh, so this is a dagger. Yeah, it's kind of bad, but it's okay. Let's do it more or less all right okay so the thing that we want to do now notice that this is a trace and it can even write this trace in the basis of h naught but I, I would like to to essentially try to take the commentator here to to get this e a g either to this side or to this side okay and what's the best way to do it here? Well, we're going to have to use the so-called Baker-Hausdorff formula, where it, uh, and this is one of the forms of the Baker-Hausdorff, right? Essentially, it treats about the exponentials of sums of operators when their commutator is not zero, right? So one of the, for the forms of the Baker-Hausdorff formula, which is gonna be very useful for us here, is this one so exponential of a and a here is an operator b is also an operator okay uh, and this i can if i expand this in in orders of a and you know put b you can you can come to the conclusion that this product e to the exponential of a times b times exponential of minus a is going to be b plus the commutator of a and b plus one one half the commutator 
of A with a commentator of A and B and so on and so forth, right? So the first thing that we want to do here is to calculate the commentator of A and B. In this case, we have, say, AK and the operator A here is just H0 times tau. So tau will definitely uh, factorize here. So we need to calculate the commutator of a h naught and a, which we have done many times. So let's do it once again. All right. First thing is to apply h naught to a k. That's what we do here. And then uh, I, I need to get this a k close to this a dagger k prime, right? So I get I, the first thing I do I I switch these two. So I I, I do an exchange. Here, I might get a minus sign if I'm talking about fermions. I'll get a plus sign, plus just the plus sign if I get bosons. And I get here, right? So now I have AK close to AK dagger, AK prime dagger. And this will be what? So let's just do this calculation in orange here. So if they're fermions, they anti-commute. So I'll have... A K A K dagger uh, plus A K prime dagger A K. So this is for fermions equals delta K K prime. If there are bosons, there'll be this would be the commutator, right? So I get this plus or minus sign here. So what I get is minus or plus a k prime dagger a k equals delta k k prime minus a k a k a k prime dagger, right? So if I now multiply this by minus or Plus, depending if I have bosons or fermions on this side, I would get a k prime dagger a k equals minus plus delta k minus a k a k prime dagger. That's it. It's essentially what I, what I get here. And notice this minus plus and this plus minus here. All right. So if I now do the calculation this will, I'll, I'll get a minus one no matter what no matter what wh whether there are bosons or fermions there so this is always always going to be the same commutator whether you have fermions or bosons it's going to be minus epsilon k times a k plus a k times h all right and so the commutator of h and a k is minus epsilon k a k no matter whether it's bosons or fermions that's the beauty of this free uh, propagator okay so uh, then I can write this uh, e to h naught tau a k e to the minus h naught tau equals a k minus what the commutator right epsilon k a oh there's a tau here missing sorry there is a tau here, okay, and here there's a tau square, that's a plus, okay, what else, yeah, so the next term over would be the commutator of A, of, sorry, this should be the commutator of no, yeah, the commutator of A, it's it's right. It's, it's H naught with whatever is left from here, which is minus E epsilon K A K again. So I get this squared in a sense, right? Because I'll, I'll get uh, uh, the commutator here is going to be A K, right? And now I'll have a k times this squared because I'm, I'll, I'll get another commentator, I'll get another a, a k. So this is going to be uh, uh, 
always AK here, single, single exponent, but the prefactors will go with first order, squared, third order, and et, et cetera. So if I factor out the AKs, what I'm left here it would be with an exponential of minus epsilon k tau, all right? So if I factor out the AK, for every commutator I get, there, there will be an AK coming and a tau coming. So I'll get, you know, these series. So this will be essentially the exponent, the exponential of AK, well, sorry, it's going to be AK times the exponential of minus AK tau. All right, so let's plug this back in here, right? And I'm going to substitute this and I'm, I'm going to do a similar thing to AK dagger. So we can evaluate this uh, analy analytically. All right, so I'm going to replace that uh, this here in this thermal average by this. I'm going to do the same with AK dagger, right? So with AK dagger, I'll get a plus sign here. Why? Uh, essentially, if I take the dagger of this commutator and take it to, to be uh, H dagger here, I'll get a minus sign there right? If I take the dagger of a commutator, I'll have, you know, instead of the commutator of H0 with AK, I'll have the commutator of AK dagger with H0, even though H H0 is Hermitian. So I'll get a plus sign here. But other than that, everything is works pretty much uh, the same. So when I get the A dagger, I'll have a plus sign here with tau prime. That's what's written there. Okay, so I'll have at the end of the day this minus sign times the thermal average of AK, AK dagger, and this there's no time uh, dependence here, all the time dependence is included here now, all right? Exponential of minus epsilon K tau minus tau prime, all right, and, and that, that that's again makes sense, it only depends on the difference between tau and tau prime. And what is this? Now this I can again do uh, use the either commutator or anti-commutator relations that I had here depending on whether these are bosonic or fermionic operators and I can write this as this yeah so this sorry this uh, which is there's still this minus sign and then one since k equals k prime here plus or minus bosons or fermions, the number operator thermal average. And this we already have, have already calculated in one of the assignments. This is either the Bose-Einstein or the Fermi-Dirac uh, distributions for a given temperature and, a, and the energy epsilon K, since the Hamiltonian is uh, quadratic, okay? So that's what, what I, get, I get for tau plus larger than tau prime, I get an expression that involves uh, the Bose of Einstein or Fermi direct distribution here for epsilon k, which is this, sorry, there. Uh, for bosons is, is with a minus sign, for fermions with, with a plus sign, the inverse of this. And for tau prime larger than tau, I do get a um, a the the time order is is reverse in this sense, so I should get here a yeah so there is yeah there there should be a plus or minus sign here, so yeah there's there's gonna be a another plus or minus sign that I forgot to put. This is because of the time order, the time ordering operator. Now I, I, I have to switch the order. Okay, so the, there's still this minus. I'll, I'll keep this minus sign there. Right, I'll just put this plus or minus there. Uh, now the AK 
uh, and here I'm calculating the diagonal part, all right? So I'm always calculating the, the, the diagonal Green's functions. K, the K here in the dagger is equal to the K there. So, but there'll be here exponential of plus epsilon K tau, tau prime minus tau, all right? Uh, there will be this plus or minus, and uh, here I'll get precisely the number operators, the the not the number operator, yeah, the number operator, but the expected value at a given temperature. So this would be the bose einstein or fermi direct distribution directly. So if I put everything together, the prop, the free propagator will from tau prime to tau is going to be uh, minus sign. Here, if tau is larger than tau prime, I'll get this theta function tau minus tau prime, and I get this result, one plus or minus n, b or fermion, depending on which particles you have. And here is exponential of minus epsilon k tau minus tau prime, which is the same exponential here, in fact. And the, the other one will have this plus or minus sign because of the time ordering. Now theta tau prime minus tau, uh, both on the Fermion distribution. So this is a closed form for the free propagator where I know all the energies if I diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So this should be uh, pretty standard. Okay, so we concluded the first step. We calculated the free prop propagator and, and imaginary time. Now let's do the Fourier transform of this and see why do we get these uh, discrete frequencies. So let's do it. Okay, so now we're talking about the Fourier transform of the free propagator, but I'll make some gen very general considerations of the Fourier transform of these Matsubara functions, Green's functions in general, all right? So let's again start with the case where tau is larger than, than tau prime. So I have the order of AK and AK prime. Here I'm considered, considering the, say, a non-diagonal Green's functions just for illustrative purposes. But let's look at what's, what's going on here inside this trace. So this could be, say, a sum over eigenstates of age. So we'll, I would have something like this. I know the spectrum, okay? H alpha equals E alpha. So that's the many body spectrum of H. So this would be like the Lyman representation, if you want. So I, I can include, uh, say, I know how this, this, these operators act on alpha. I could put a, a one here, right? Or better yet, not, not there, but here. Uh, then uh, if I put a one here, which is sum over alpha prime, alpha prime, alpha prime, what do I get? I get this. Uh, oh, this would have E minus beta E alpha. Uh, I'll put the minus here, so there will be minus tau minus tau tau prime times E alpha, okay? Then the matrix element of alpha, alpha prime of AK. Here, the same thing, I would, I would get the E to the minus E alpha prime tau prime minus theta. Here, I would have then the matrix element of alpha prime and AK dagger. A K prime dagger with alpha. All right, so this is like the the Lyman representation. Now notice that this will only converge if uh, this thing will decay for large tau minus tau prime. Okay, so. Uh, this one is okay, right? So E alpha, I can, I can start with, say, E, e naught equals zero, 
so that all the these these energies are positive so the, so that I, I get the, the right conversion uh, convergence here right so this is uh, this should be okay but not this one for this one to be okay I need this to be larger than zero okay otherwise I, I might I might have uh, some something that is increasingly large for large tau minus tau prime so that's I definitely don't want to do that so it means that uh, for this to be larger than zero I need uh, to for uh, beta to be larger than tau minus tau prime okay so if I do the same analysis for large for tau prime larger than tau I would get uh, essentially the order would be reversed here so in here I, I would have say the uh, uh, essentially exchange tau prime and tau right I still have minus beta but instead of minus here I would have a plus or a minus tau prime minus tau and in that case I, I would say that tau minus tau prime is larger than minus beta okay and that would I, I would take it for convergence now one important point here is that remember I'm doing imaginary time evolution so these taus are real right so I can definitely compare them to beta so because both of, of them are real numbers so if t is imaginary time is imaginary tau which is i times t is real okay so that's uh, one point that we should keep always in mind when you're talking about these Matsubara Green's functions okay let's keep going and since now I have this uh, limitation in tau minus tau prime if I want to take the Fourier transform this would lead me uh, naturally to a set of discrete uh, frequencies why because I, I have uh, a limited domain here so my integral say if I want to take the the Fourier transform from uh, of this I would integrate that from minus beta to beta there's this factor of one and a, one half here that uh, is part of the definition of the Fourier transform uh, of my Matsubara Green's functions times this the frequencies with n and pi over beta with n an integer times tau minus tau prime d tau minus tau prime so integrating in, in time in 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 tau now why, why is this well the the inverse Fourier transform would be now a sum so this is uh, uh, essentially a discrete uh, Fourier transform on this side right so this uh, these are, are numbers uh, so this will be a sum over gkk prime of n or where n is this integer with e to the minus i n pi and uh, by you know you need this one this factor of one over beta here to to get if I replace this in here I would get a delta function of say something like this right you, you can do it yourself but you would need something like this this n and prime equals 1 over 2 pi minus pi pi e to the i n minus n prime theta d theta so this is a representation of the discrete delta function over a limited range right so if you do a change of variables you would see that these two replace but you, you, you need this one over beta here to, when you do the change of variables from this to be to minus pi to pi okay all right so with this I can uh, show I, I, I can calculate this uh, Fourier transform 
by noting a couple of off points. The first one is that I don't I don't need to take this uh, integral from minus beta to beta. I, I can take it from zero to beta since this Green's functions has an interesting property, an interesting symmetry around zero. So and 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 the the, the symmetry is this. If I have this calculated at a negative uh, t minus tau prime, and this is the absolute value, so this is a negative number. This will be equal to plus or minus, depending on you have or on you whether you have bosons or fermions, of g k k prime beta minus this uh, this number. Okay, so, which would be positive, right? So why why is that? I mean, uh, why why does the symmetry come? So I, I if this is true, of course I can you know break my integral from in terms of only negative arguments here and replace by this, and that, then I'll have just uh, the this would be a function over positive values, and I can take take my integral from zero to beta. And this property comes from the following. So if I take this to be negative, if I go back and, and into the definition, it means that I have to reorder here so that you know this would be uh, a k dagger at this negative value. So this say a k prime dagger at zero and a k at minus this. I would get something like this. This would be the order that there will be this plus or minus sign here due to time ordering. Then I can play around with these operators here inside the trace and actually get them to 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 give me a sequence inside here, just which will be a a k at exponential of this times h a k exponential of minus this times h and what's in here if i replace now into the definition of the green's functions i would get precisely the 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 green's functions with a positive time with a k prime dagger here at zero time and an a k calculated at this time beta minus absolute value of tau minus tau prime. Okay, so let's go back to this integral and see what happens to the integral from minus beta to zero. Okay, and I wrote it right down here. Okay, so if that property is true, so if Integration from minus beta to zero, this is always negative. So that means that this should be equal to GKK prime at beta minus the absolute value of this, or since this is already negative, this should be beta plus tau minus tau prime. And I'm gonna call this variable here. So this is positive now. I'm gonna call this a double time double tau double prime. So now let's do this change of variables here. So tau double prime equals beta plus tau minus tau prime. Okay. So when this is minus beta, of course, this is zero. So the integral would be zero. When this is, uh, this is zero, this would be beta. Okay. So, and this would be still, because of that property, would be GKK prime of tau double prime. Now, what happens to this exponent? Of course, now, tau minus tau prime is 
what is going to be tau double prime minus beta, right? So I'll have e i n pi over beta. There will be a tau double prime here, and already put this d to tau double prime there, right? Because d this is a constant, so but there is be is going to be uh, these other point here, which is gonna be this minus beta, okay? Minus beta here added to this. So there will be a, a point here which would be e to the i n pi beta times minus beta, and this is minus i n pi. So uh, this integral, of course, is is the same as the positive one. So I can now write, uh, of course, this will, will have this plus or minus sign. But most importantly, there will be this e to the minus i n pi here that will enter here now. All right, so now I got my this integral. There's this factor of 1 half there. Uh, still need to keep there. But it will be 1 plus or minus e to the minus i n pi times this integral of 0 to beta g k k prime dummy variable here could be time tau double prime of whatever but that's that's the integral we have to evaluate but notice this this point okay if these are bosons n cannot be uh, odd why because if i have a plus sign here and n would be odd this would be a minus one and i'll get zero so if I have bosons, n has to be even. Now if I have fermions, it's the other way around. This minus sign here tells me that n has to be odd. So for fermions, this n has to be, say, an odd number 2n plus 1. Now, not only my frequency is quantized, but it assumes different values, different parity, parities, values with different parities for whether we have bosons or fermions, okay? Now, it would be an interesting exercise to think what would happen for anions, right? Uh, and uh, I'll leave that to you, but for bosons or for fermions, definitely these uh, frequencies for of Matsubato would be either pair, uh, even for bosons or odd, an odd number of pi over beta for fermions. So that uh, essentially tells me that whenever I do a Fourier transform of these imaginary time Matsubata functions, I get uh, this, okay? And so let's do this calculation for the free case. All right, so let's now calculate the Fourier transform of this object. Uh, and already noticed that this would be of this form, so I have to integrate over 0 to beta, and these frequencies are either uh, even uh, multiples of pi over beta or odd numbers of pi over beta, whether, depending on whether you have bosons or fermions. So let's start with, say, tau plus, tau, tau larger than tau prime. Uh, then I would get uh, essentially put this term here with the, the minus sign there, okay? So it would be minus 1 plus or minus n bosons fermions of epsilon k e omega minus epsilon k tau minus tau prime and I integrate here over in tau minus tau prime. Now notice there's this minus sign here, 1 plus or minus nothing of this depend on the time. So I just integrate this exponential. So of course this exponent goes to the denominator here. And now I have this E of omega m beta, right? Evaluate times E o omega m minus epsilon k evaluated from b time equals 
tau minus tau prime equals beta, which is this, minus the same as 0, which gives me 1. So let's look at what was the structure here, especially when I can, I'm considering bo either bosons or fermions, and that will change here, or will change, and also will change the parity of these frequencies there. So let's scroll down a bit. And I have now this. All right. So let's consider the case for bosons. When this is a boson, so I have uh, this would be equal to exponential of epsilon k minus 1. So for bosons, uh, what what would it, what I get? I would get this to be 2m pi, so this would be 1. I'll have epsilon minus epsilon k beta, all right? Minus 1, and I have 1 plus any boson. So if I do the calculation, real quick calculation using this expression, I come to the conclusion that the whole thing here, this whole thing in the numerator here, apart from this minus sign, is minus 1. When I include this plus sign, I get plus 1. All right, so for bosons, the free propagator is 1 over 1 i omega m minus epsilon k. And you can e easily convince you of that, convince yourself of that. Now for fermions, let's see what, what I get for fermions. Well, for fermions, this would also would, would give me minus 1, right? Because these are an odd number times pi over beta. So I get e to the i pi times a, a odd factor, odd number here. So it, it will always be minus 1. So I get minus epsilon minus epsilon k beta minus 1, right? And the, what enters here is the fermion uh, distribution with a plus sign here. So 1 minus this is going to be e, e to the beta epsilon k plus 1, then minus 1, so I get 0. I get just exponential of beta epsilon k. Exponential beta epsilon k plus 1 in the denominator times this minus 1 times uh, uh, epsilon minus to the minus epsilon k beta plus 1, right? If I take this epsilon minus epsilon k beta out, I would get this. This would give, give me 1. This will cancel out like this, right? And this will give me 1. And now I'm left with the minus 1. So no matter what I do, whether I have bosons or fermions, the free propagator is the same. And it is uh, given by 1 over i omega m minus epsilon k. It is the free propagator either for bosons or for fermions. doesn't matter. The only difference here is that for bosons, these frequencies are an even number times pi over beta, and for fermions, these is an odd number times pi over beta. So another comment on the free propagator that I'd like to make is how it relates to the retarded Green's functions that we calculated a while back for free electrons, right? So we did using equations of motion way back there in the class on, on equations of motions in Zubarev. Uh, and here we came to the conclusion that this is very similar to that. This case is 1 over this, that omega plus, right? Omega plus i eta minus epsilon k. This would be the retarded one. The advanced would be similar except with a minus i eta here. And the, the thing is, how can we relate to, to, the, to the Matsubara free propagator? And the answer is that if I just, you know, I, I have to take a stroll on the complex plane and make this imaginary frequencies here go into the real axis. And essentially that's the definition of an analytic continuation. All right. So this is, is very crucial because at the end of the day, 
for the most part for linear response for many other applications spectral functions and so on we want the retarded Green's function so we, we might even be able to calculate this in fact methods such as quantum monte carlo they give you this essentially the, the imaginary time uh evolution uh which is going to be a thermal average at the, at the at the end of the day so how do we go from there to to the real frequency retarded Green's functions so you do this analytic continuation so uh, there's different procedures to do that but essentially you have to uh, take these discrete frequencies in in, in imaginary in the imaginary axis and take them to this omega plus i eta just a little above above the real axis and uh, how do you do that in practice you know you have to take some limit I mean it, it is at the end of the day a limit and you you would you would treat this as a as a complex function and uh, slowly take this part these frequencies into a real axis plus a correction of course if you are if you want to take the the the, the advanced Green's functions you you have to take it from below the the real axis so you, you would you would be thinking of these negative frequencies okay so in, in a sense it's very similar to what we had for the 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 zero temperature formalism which, which where we had that um, that positive frequencies and negative frequencies would relate in the Lyman representation to either the retarded or the advanced uh, Green's functions and it's pretty much the same here uh, if I want to do an analytic con continuation to omega plus i eta I'll, I'll have to start from the positive frequencies here and they would give me this information and then do this analytic cont continuation to the real axis or real axis plus a small uh, positive increment or I, I go from the negative frequencies into uh, the real axis minus a small uh, positive increment right so this would give me then this analytic continuation here would give me the retarded Green's functions and this one would be give me the advanced for the most part we, we want to focus on this on this case so this is the the point is once you calculated the Matsubara Green's functions you can always try to recover uh, in principle you can recover the, the retarded Green's functions by doing this analytic continuation all right so we come full circle and we calculated this and and also sh showed you how to recover the retarded Green's functions once you calculate the the, the propagator or the Matsubara Green's functions okay now how do we actually calculate something that is not just the free propagator that we did analytically and exactly without resorting to any uh, approximations so in real life of course we uh, for say an interacting system this is not so easy to do so we have to do via Feynman diagrams very in a very similar way like like we did for the zero temperature time order Green's functions so let's see how does that work all right so let's write the Matsubara Green's functions now in an interaction picture and I'm going to use those two properties that we arrived in the first slide and with those say if I take this one and plug in here and these two plug in here and here and notice that u beta 0 times u 0 t tau is u beta tau just the properties of the this propagator what I get is this right and where these two operators in tau are written in in the interaction picture now what I gain here notice that now my density operator is the non-interacting one so if my Hamiltonian is H naught plus an interaction say H1 
what I'm doing here is just calculating these traces. You can calculate these traces in the non-interacting basis. The price I pay is that I have to evaluate these uh, uh, now these operators, these time evolution operators, but I can write them in a series, like in a series of powers of H1. So this is good for doing perturbation theory, just like we did in the case of uh, time order Green's functions in real time. So now if I put everything together, what I get here, both on the numerator and the denominator is a thermal expected value or thermal average over non-interacting states only. So if I know the non-interacting spectrum, I can definitely calculate this expected values, right? But now I, I have uh, to, just like we did in the case of time order Green's functions, is to write this in perturbation theory. And we can do that, can do that uh, by employing essentially the same arguments that we did in real-time evolution. And uh, uh, you, you might want to go back to the, to the class on, on time-ordered Green's functions, where you, we define uh, this in terms of Wick's theorem and try to you know, calculate things like this and also use Feynman diagrams. So at the end of the day, what I'm going to have is this Matsubara Green's functions written as a, as a sum over terms in powers of the interaction H1. But most importantly, these averages will be calculated in the non-interacting state, in the non-interacting basis, and involving only non-interacting states. So here's the perturbative expansion. It's very similar to the one in which we did, which you sort of derived for the real-time evolution, with two important uh, differences. One is that here I, I had i minus i to the power of n. Here is I have only minus 1. Right? So there's no i in the, either in the definition of the, the Matsubara Green's functions or in the series here. So that's a difference. And the integrals in the, in the intermediate times do not range from minus infinity to infinity. They run from 0 to beta. And when we did the, the Fourier transform, we argued of why that is, right? So these uh, propagations in tau can go only... Uh, from minus beta to beta or and we already have done that we, there's a symmetry that you can you can write in terms of zero and beta all right so this is the expression for a perturbative expansion in terms of an interacting uh correction right which is h1 this would be a, a quartic term and uh you can sum up diagrams just like we did in in the time order Green's functions case. Uh, here, H1 is a quartic operator. So uh, there will be a se series of connected and disconnected diagrams, and we keep only the, the connected diagrams because the disconnect diagrams here will cancel with those coming from this denominator here, just as like we did. And so this will just be a sum over connected diagrams. There will be a, also a proper self-energy and, and, and so on and so forth. Same thing, except here that I know how to calculate the free propagators. And more importantly, uh, this will be valid for, for non-zero temperatures, which can be a parameter. So this is still a perturbation expansion in the in the interaction but i'm not restricted to zero temperatures anymore that's the the gain that we're doing here when we we do this perturbative expansions and and sometimes temperature can be uh important you know to evaluate uh, quantities at non-zero temperature even say conductance like uh 
in a real experiment you always have temperature calculating the conductance so you want to do linear response theory at finite temperatures and if you have an interacting system that's the way to go to to calculate the the Matsubara Green's functions perhaps writing that Feynman diagrams or doing you, you can do mean field if you don't want to do perturbation theory uh, uh, there's you know uh, pros and cons on, on each approach so I'm presenting here the one that where you can actually do perturbative expansion RPA and all that so let's review the rules for Feynman diagrams now when I when I have these Matsubara Green's functions the rules are very similar to those that we had for the time ordered Green's functions at zero temperature uh, with a couple of differences first uh, here you have to associate uh, propagators which is going to be g naught not i g naught as before and notice that the interactions here you have these minus ones associated with interaction so for every interaction line you associate minus k prime m prime k double prime m double prime so on if you are in in real space then these should be real space coordinates and, and whatnot and the other important difference is that the integral in tau is done from zero to beta uh, for all these tau one to tau n's and but you also have to multiply each diagram by minus one over f where f is the number of fermionic closed loops and you multiply by this one over n uh, n factorial to to get the, the the proper point so apart from the you know now you you put the Matsubara propag free propagator here everything is pretty much the same so let's look at the rules now for when you when you Fourier transform these things now if you have a, a uniform system you can where you can do both a Fourier transform in space and in time and you already saw how how the Fourier transform in time will give us this much about frequencies which are different depending on whether you have bosons or fermions now you you might have k the momentum k is a good quantum number as well in a uniform system so here you still draw all connected uh, diagrams with n interaction lines and you associate uh, each of these propagators or a k and and a, and a much about a frequency to propagating lines and q and iqn to interaction lines Notice that these IQNs might be zero, but most importantly, they, they are going to be bosonic. So if uh, typically, I mean, you, you can leave them as a, a variable, and then you, when, once you, con you write a conservation of quadri-momentum at each vertex, you, you might get a zero here, but it's, it's fine. But just remember that, uh, as in the case of zero, the zero temperature formalism, uh, here the approximation is that this interaction is not is not is kind of instantaneous but we do associate this factor here to to account for a small uh, retardation so that we the, the sums over over much water frequency are, are well behaved but let, we'll, we'll get to that now to every continuous line you need to associate one over beta and, and this one over beta comes from the Fourier transform in in time and one over V comes from the Fourier transform in K so you associate this these factors with each free propagator at each line and to every interaction line you associate minus V of Q IQN and, and as I mentioned before IQN here is bosonic right so you are uh, each vertex you are creating two fermions so the overall uh, uh, if you want you you are adding two two odd frequencies 
So at the end of the day, you get a even frequency. So it's, this is why it is bosonic. So if you conserve, you know, the the frequencies in in in, in the vertex, uh, uh, two odd numbers add up, or or the difference or the sum of two odd numbers is always a a even number, right? So that's why you get these to be bosonic. And as I mentioned, to every equal time propagator, you associate this factor to account for the uh, small retardation for the potential so that your sums over much wider frequencies are well behaved. And you apply the conservation of both momentum and, and these frequencies at each vertex and integrate over internal momenta and sum over the much wider frequencies. And this is a, an important point. I'm going to uh, comment about this in a, in a second. But again, you multiply each diagram by minus 1 to the power of f, where f is the number of fermionic closed loops, and you multiply by 1 over n factorial. So remember, these are not now are, uh, are discrete variables, so you have to sum over them and not, and not uh, integrate over them. So how do we do these sums? So there's a, a trick there, and uh, let's discuss that uh, to wrap up this class. So these sums of over mezzobutter frequencies, essentially we involve things like this. So you have two free propagators with different k's and different uh, frequencies and you conserve the quadrant momentum at the vertex and you end up with something like that. Maybe with this exponential, with this eta here, or well, I think I put epsilon, so let's put epsilon uh, over the, the rest. So a small number, and, and this would be a small positive number, right? And this will eventually go to zero. Uh, so, so, you know, to converge, and this is going to be important here, we're going to see. So it's going to be something like that. So how do we go about performing these sums? So let's start with the more... Um, basic sum, which would be something like that. This would be a very uh, basic Matsubata sum, which would be 1 over beta, a sum over m of the free propagator, uh, perhaps with this uh, this factor here, e to the omega m epsilon, right? And we know that for bosons, we have uh, these to be a even number times pi over beta, and for Fermi's this is an odd number, times pi over beta. Okay, yeah, this is a beta. Okay, all right. So the trick here is to write this sum as a sum of residues, over the residues that come from an in integral in a complex plane. So I'm, instead of performing the sum, at the end of the day, I'm going to do a integral in a complex plane. And this integral will involve the occupation, meaning the, the di distribution, either Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein, depending on whether they're fermions or bosons. And there will be a minus sign if they're fermions, a plus sign if they're bosons. Uh, and so if I can calculate this integral and, and look at the residues of these functions, here, I will be able to do this Matsubara sums. All right, so uh, let's scroll down a bit and see how, how does this work. So the reasoning is as this. Uh, let's say that I, I have a function, complex function that looks my like my my Fermi distribution if I take real values of this variable v. But this is defined in a complex plane, okay? So where are the poles of these functions? Of course, the poles is when this diverges, so when this equals to minus 1. And for fermions, this will happen exactly at a uh, when z naught equals i times an 
odd number times pi over beta. So that this times beta is i to i pi times a, an odd number. So this gets minus 1. So if I integrate this over the complex plane, uh, the residues here would be have to calculate at these poles. Same thing as as for the boson, the the, the boson, uh, the Bose-Einstein distribution would be e to the exponential of beta z minus one. So the poles would be at i two m pi over beta. So that whenever this exponential is one. I get a zero and a, and this will give me a pole. Now, what would be the residues for these functions? So let's go and calculate the residues, say for the Fermi. Uh, the Fermi distribution would be something like this, right? How do I calculate the residues? It's a simple residue. I just do Z minus, minus the pole times the function and the limit of z going to z naught and then I have to calculate this limit I can do a, say a L'Hospital rule and uh, differentiate on top and on the bottom I, I get this and then I get beta times e to the e evaluated at the, at the pole which is uh, minus 1 right by definition and this is minus 1 over beta okay I can do the same thing for the other one and calculate the residues here of this function and I get plus 1 over beta. All right, so that's interesting. If I only had this, I know that uh, for any of these poles, the residue is the same as 1 over beta. So let's uh, keep, keep on going. Now, I have now this uh, poles of uh, this function, right? So it's these ones. But I have these and these. So if I evaluate the residues here for this ones, I would get 1 over beta, okay? Times what? Times the sum sum over all of that those two functions calculated at the at the poles right so hopefully these will be will be analytical at the poles so s would be essentially so every residue is one over beta so the, it factors out so if i multiply this by 2 pi i i would get this integral Notice that this is 1 over beta, but is minus if you have fermions and plus if you have bosons, right? Right there. So then, yes, uh, unless I have other poles to worry about uh, here, if I only consider the, the, the poles of the Fermi direct or the Bose-Einstein distribution, this would be precisely uh, S of of uh, either fermions or, or bosons. Now, what what happens is that these might have poles as well. And in fact, in fact, if this is the free propagator, we will have a huge branch cut, not only a pole, but uh, there will be a branch cut here, right? So this will have something like that, uh, a z minus epsilon k. So whenever z is equal to is I'm crossing at the real real axis here, I'll have a branch cut. So that tells me that uh, in order to, to evaluate these uh, functions, these sums, I would uh, either have to, uh, I will have to choose a contour that is actually composed of two disconnected contours. One that goes a little bit below the, the Fermi, the, the, the real axis, which is I'm calling C1, and another one that would go a little bit above the real axis uh, when, when for if I'm if, if this is the actual uh, the actual free propagator, okay, and then the sum of these will get will give me this uh, sum here correctly. So of course now I, I need to to evaluate this. 
uh, free propagator at all these frequencies and, and then try to, to do the sum here, right? And uh, that, that would be one, one way of looking at this. The, the other way is that uh, sometimes the, the, the sum of Matsubara frequencies might not be so uh, simple as this one. I might have to, to do things like that. So I have to look at the different poles here uh, and, and, and either branch cuts and see what, what I get here to evaluate the sum, sums of Matsubara frequencies. So you can definitely do that in a, in a few cases, uh, especially if you know the, the free propagators. But this is a technical difficulty that you actually encounter when you're calculating higher order diagrams in terms of these Matsubara sums. All right, so that, that's it for this class. So in the next class, uh, we're going to continue to look over that and and see phonons and, and see how those enters into phonons and BCS theory. All right, I'll see you then.